become beloved in our scripture reading to a short passage in Galatians chapter 5. Paul here in this section is reminding us and he is making the assumption that you and I as believers have within our hearts the indwelling Holy Spirit, an amazing truth taught in the New Testament. But we also have within us our old nature, our old Adamic nature, the part which still remains, and he calls it, as you know, the flesh. And there is a conflict in our lives between that old part of us, which is still there, and the new part, we have a new nature as well, but we also have the Holy Spirit. And the conflict is between, he says, the flesh and the Holy Spirit. We have to be aware of what we are, and we need to walk in the Spirit. Because if we don't, you and I can mess up big time. There's no telling what you or I could do. We're not immune from anything. Galatians 5, let's read this, verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So we have this old thing within us, the flesh, and he is urging us to be empowered, be under the controlling influence of the Spirit, Allow the Spirit to carry us, and none of us does this perfectly. But that's the exhortation of God. If we are careless, any one of us could do unimaginable things that are really, really bad. That's what happened with Samson. And so let's turn in our Bibles to Judges chapter 16 this morning. We would think if we were naive that a believer would never do this. What Samson did. Now I remind you he is a believer. Hebrews 11 is clear about that. I remind you that he is a man of God, he is a Nazarite, he is a servant of God. And we would say, how in the world? I mean, this is embarrassing. Could a man of God, the Holy Spirit used him so powerfully, do what he is about to do? Well, the same thing happened in the New Testament in the church in Corinth, remember that. The exact same thing. And Paul has to castigate them very firmly about their immoral conduct. So yes, this can happen. But here it is. It's shocking. Judges 16 and verse 1. Now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there. In one sense, that's not his fault. I mean, if you're walking down the street and one's there, right, it's not your fault that she's there and you see her. The problem is what he did and went into her. This is the second Philistine woman he's gotten involved with. This is a weakness in his part, on his part. Somehow the Philistine pagans 
are seductive to him. Now, God, at times when people do this type of thing, when believers do this, God, at times, you know this, it happened in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 11, God strikes people dead. At times, that happened. It happened in Corinth. They were coming to the Lord's table, and God struck them dead. But God is also long-suffering. And God allows him to live. But God is warning. His life is on the edge of death. Really close. And God delivers him. That should have straightened him up. But as we shall see, it did not. Now, if you just turn over to the back of the outline for just a second, you have a map. And I want you to see where he went. Philistia is there, and it consisted pretty much of five city-states. The city-state that he went into was Gaza, and you can see it. You still have Gaza. It's the same word. Palestinians are there, of course. It's the same word from antiquity. Gaza, and it's the same area. That's where he goes. Now, this is pretty reckless going into Philistine territory. After all, he has killed hundreds and hundreds of Philistines. This is pretty reckless behavior on his part. They are going to ambush him. That is their intention. This is the time for them to assassinate him. And it would have happened apart from divine intervention. So this is why God is merciful. I mean, he is on the edge of death. But God intervenes. And it's a warning from God. God warns. God warns all of us. And you and I must always take heed. When a warning comes, be able to read what's happening. God is speaking. Shape up. We need to listen. Notice verse 2. When the Gazites were told Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying, In the morning, when it is daylight, we will kill him. This is an ambush situation. He could have been ambushed. This could have been the end of the narrative. His life is done. Disaster. Well, somehow he finds out about it. And this is a remarkable thing. That God still did not take his strength away. This guy is, this guy is a superman. Verse 3. And Samson lay low till midnight. Then he arose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two gateposts. Now, who knows what the weight of him? I'm guessing thousands of pounds. Pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. You look at your map there, Gaza, we already looked at that in the lower left. He's really a symbol of foreshadowing of Christ. He is, as it were, as good as dead. It's going to be an ambush. He's enclosed, as it were, already in a tomb, foreshadowing Christ, who was dead in a tomb. And Jesus broke forth. And Samson breaks forth. This is a foreshadowing of the ultimate champion, Christ. And you notice over on the right in Judea, Hebron. That's almost 40 miles away. Carrying this, whatever the weight was, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds, no doubt. We couldn't even move it. And 
God warns. God delivers. And he should have shaped up. He learns his lessons with great difficulty. God has to really beat this man down to get his attention. And there are people like that today. They don't get the message. And that's what happens. We come to our second point. You would think that by this time, he's gone through two Philistine women, pagans. That maybe it's not a good idea to be getting involved with these Philistine women. He still does not learn the lesson. And so we come to verse 4. And this is in Philistia. This valley ran through Philistia. He's still living on the edge. It's still dangerous. Dangerous behavior. Little prudence in this man. He is a believer. But little prudence. Verse 4. Afterward it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. He's not a good judge of character. No doubt she's beautiful. Hourly. But she is a devil and a snake inwardly. She is wicked, evil to the core. She is the Judas of the Old Testament. And with her, it's all money. And you destroy human life for the sake of silver coins, a pile of silver coins. And you will snuff out a life for the sake of a pile of silver coins. You see, it's all about me. And you use other people to achieve your ends and your self-elevation. And we have that in the United States. In human trafficking of children. And we have that in the abortion industry. The butchery in the abortion industry. We have many Delilahs who are so-called physicians who in reality are a serpent. There's really no difference. It's all about me. It's all about my cash flow. And you destroy human life. This is what she is all about. And he is, notice verse 4, he loved the woman. No ability to assess character. Notice with me the plan. Verse 5. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him and find out where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Now, if you go back to the map for just a second, I want to point out the five cities of the, the Philistines, the lords. Okay. Samson had been a plague for years. And so she's in the valley of Sorek. They find out about it. Look at Gaza and go north. Ashkelon, go north. Ashdod. Go a little bit northeast, Ekron, go south, Gath. The five lords of the Philistines, 1,100 pieces of silver, 5,500 pieces of silver dumped in front of her, if you will basically turn him over to us. Money sounds great. She's made, she's made for life. Don't need to work anymore. Snuffed his life out. It's a good deal. 
He's a total hypocrite. Well, notice verse 6. We start with the questions, and it's basically the same question, which comes three times, verse 6. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and with what you may be bound to afflict you. Now he likes these intellectual sports. We've seen this in his life so far. He's, he's very witty. There's a certain intelligence there, a lack of prudence, but certainly intelligent. And he's sporting with her through this whole thing. See, there's a mystery to, to my vast strength. My strength will leave me. First, try this on me. Look at verse 7. And Samson said to her, If they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings. First of all, you get the bowstrings. And notice that it's seven, not six, not eight, not ten, not five, seven. And they have to be fresh and not yet dried. You do that with me, and I'm just a regular guy. Of course, he's fooling with her. It doesn't work. Verse 11. She keeps after him, and here's the next proposal. So he said to her, if they bind me securely with, notice it's not just ropes, it's new ropes, and not just new ropes, but ropes that have never been used. He's enjoying the, the game, playing. Well then, the game continues as we drop down to verse 13. Middle of the verse, third sentence in verse 13. And he said to her, if you weave these seven locks. Now, notice, don't just go for a couple of locks, six, ten, whatever. It, take the seven locks of my head. If you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of the loom. Well, that's an interesting thing. Sort of weave it in there. And then I'm weak. Of course, he's just fooling with her. And she's crying and carrying on. And this is something you never do with a person unless you trust him or her utterly and completely. Verse 17. She was unworthy of this trust. You cannot fully trust a pagan. Is the lesson. God had been saying that. You cannot trust them. Luther said that. The Bible says that. Trust is for God. And some special people. But we read in verse 17 that he told her all his heart and said to her, He is casting precious truth, pearls, before the swine. Remember Jesus said that? Don't do that. Don't ever do that. The precious truth before the swine. Never do that. He said, no razor has ever come upon my head for I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. My strength is found in my total consecration to God. Beloved, your strength is found in your total consecration to God. That's how you and I become strong. Bow the knee to King Jesus. Give your life to Him. You have vast strength. 
God will make you strong. That's why he was strong. He was a Nazarite. And he was a Judas. Drop down to verse 19. And she lulled him to sleep on her knees. Called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. That she began to torment him. And his strength left him. Of course, he is bound. But he lost all of his strength. And why is that? Well, I'll drop down to verse 20 and look at the third sentence. You know, beloved, this can happen to you and me. The same exact thing. We read, but he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. The enabling presence of God left him. He's still a saved man, but the enabling presence of the Lord left him. That can happen to any of us if we're not careful in guarding our relationship with God. Not listening to the Spirit, grieving the Spirit. The Lord leaves strength is gone. Walk closely with God is the message of this text to each of us. We come to our last point, the divine chastening. He had started out so well and You can just imagine what this would be like if this happened to you or if it happened to me. We all know this. We've known this since we were kids. We heard this story of Samson. Even movies made of this. You drop down to verse 21. And and Delilah could care less. A hard heart, she could care less. She's got her 5,500 silver coins wealth Who cares about this guy? Look at the barbarians they were. Verse 21, Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes. The most precious thing that you and I have, right? Our eyes. Most precious thing. Gone. And brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters and he became a grinder in the prison. These were, no doubt, days of remorse for him. My life is gone. I brought it all on myself. I was a fool. I blame myself. It's probably where he's at. He is a believer. But there he is. What he could have been if he had given his life fully, totally to God. What he could have been. You notice this. Think about this, this great truth. Because, you know, we probably all have remorse, all of us. I should have lived closer to God. I should have. I think we all would say that. I should have. We all would say that. But, you know, God still loves us. And you get a hint of that here in verse 22. The writer, whoever wrote the book of Judges, very creative, very skillful, and he's foreshadowing what's going to happen. Look at this beautiful statement. Verse 22. However, 
the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. Wait, God's not done with him. Grace, love, God still loves him. Well, this takes us then to the pagan mind. And you see uh, how warped the Philistines were in their theology. They don't worship the true and the living God. God who is infinite spirit. Elohim, who created the heavens and the earth out of nothing. The God of Genesis 1. They don't worship the divine infinite spirit. They worship a giant fish with a man's head. Warped, darkened understanding. A false world view gripped by Satan. That's who these people were and loving every moment of it. And we see this in verse 23. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon. There's their fish god. Imagine you bowing down before a fish. How warped you would be in your thinking. This is God? Come on. They rejoiced and they said, Our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. So they're praising their God. And then they want to sport and make merry with Samson. We drop down to verse 25. So it happened when their hearts were married that they said, Call for Samson that he may perform for us. Humiliate him further. So they called for Samson from the prison and he performed for them. Who knows what he was doing, but sort of sporting you know, with him, humiliating him, whatever he had to do, whatever it was. Verse 26, then Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, let me feel, feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. So there he is in the vast temple of Dagon in Gaza. He cannot see but he could feel. And the lad leads him up to the pillars. Verse 27. The temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. Think of those five wretched lords who did this to him, who cut out his eyes. Guess what? Those guys are there. About 3,000 men and women on the roof watching while Samson performed. Beloved, Samson knows his theology. He is instructed in the Word of God. You see this in the terms that he uses for God. You notice in verse 28 the word Lord is the word Adonai. God is sovereign. He is the Lord, not Dagon, Adonai. And you notice the word, the second word there, capital G, small o, small d, Elohim. God of Genesis 1. The God of strength. The creator. He knows his theology. None of this fish stuff. He worships Elohim Adonai. He is a believer who has been humbled by life. Notice verse 28. And Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray, strengthen me, I pray, just this once. It's just a it's just one petition, and it's just one more request. The last request ever of his entire life. Just once. I pray just this once, O oh God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And beloved, what we see here is not tragedy, but the triumph of grace. He gives his life over totally to God in this final act. 
That's how we should see this. No, verse 29. Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. And he becomes here a true Nazarite and offers himself up as a sacrifice to God in this act as a warrior. This is not suicide. He is a warrior. An act of war. This was his calling. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might and the temple fell on the lords and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. You know, Paul says to you and me in Romans 12.1, Present your bodies a living sacrifice to God. The basis of the mercies of God, the goodness of God in your life. Give yourself, Paul says, give yourself to God. And that's what Samson does. He gives himself. This is a class act by his loved ones. These are good people. These are believers. Verse 31. And his brothers and all his father's household came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Ashtael in the tomb of his father Manoah. Remember Manoah, the believer, back in chapter 13? He had died. Samson's laid to rest with his father. He had judged Israel 20 years. I want you to see one thing. Keep your hand here. Look back at chapter 13. Just want to remind you of this. This is the first glimpse that we get in Judges 13 of Samson, who is a child. And the Holy Spirit still does this with children. These are his early years in the tribal allotment of Dan there in the south. We read this in Judges 13 and verse 25. What a beautiful statement. He had first said, the prophet had first said that in verse 24 that the Lord blessed Samson. He was a boy. The Lord blessed him. But look at this. The Holy Spirit does everything good and the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at Makana Dan, notice this, where? Where? Between Zorah and Eshtael. He's a boy, the Spirit's moving on him. Now we come back to chapter 16. And guess where he's laid to rest? We read in verse 31, he buried him, they buried him, between Zorah and Eshtael. Began there, He's laid to rest there until the resurrection. Now I want to end with one verse. And let's look at Philippians 1, then we're finished. Philippians 1. And this is something that is tremendously encouraging. And I can say this the word, because the Word of God says this. To every believer here this morning, you trust us in Jesus Christ. You've called upon him. Jesus, save me. You're my savior. I look to you. My faith is in you. That God has a wonderful plan for your life as a believer. You say, how do you know that? Because of what Paul says here in Philippians 1.6. And you, you know, think about your life. Think about my life times when you and I wander away from God, not as close as we should have been. Let's think about the future, though. What a wonderful truth this is. Philippians 1.6. Paul is certain, and you and I can be certain. God is certain 
He says, being confident of this very thing. Okay, what are you confident about, Paul? Here it is. That he who has begun a good work in you, and of course he's talking about God, and of course the good work is salvation. And God did that at calling when he brought you to Jesus. That was the beginning of his good work. Called you. He who has begun a good work in you, God did that. Guess what? God's not finished with you and me. Not finished. He just began working. He's not finished. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it. God finishes what he starts. The good work of salvation, God will finish it until the day of Jesus Christ. When Jesus comes back, God will finish his good work in us. We will be saved in body and in our souls. Body and soul. Just like Jesus. Work is finished then. God will do that. 